Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, good morning, my name is Paul Slevin, Chair and President of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, you're all very welcome this morning to what is uh, one of a running sequence of events that the Chamber runs. Um, I guess in the last few weeks, all of our businesses have moved into the recovery mode from the rescue phase. Um, and as we all consider recovery, one of the, the, the critical aspects is how we get our people back to work safely and make sure that our workplaces are prepared and safe for people to operate in. Um, we believe this is a critical subject. The timing is right. And I'm very pleased to be joined this morning or this afternoon, at least, as it is now, by two experts in the field. Um, firstly, um, Martin, Martin Temple. Good morning. Thank you indeed for joining us. Martin, 20 seconds. Tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, businessman by background, uh, 30 odd years in heavy industry and then 20 or approaching 20 years in service industries and doing reviews for government and various things. Currently chair of health and safety executive and board member of uh, Sheffield Teaching Hospital Trust. Super. Thank you, Martin. You're very welcome. Thanks for your time this morning. And sitting with Martin, um, as our other expert, is Rachel Flanagan. Um, those of you in the South Wales and Wales Corridor will know Rachel very well indeed. I have been corrected this morning. Um, I thought it was Mrs. Bucket. Apparently, it's, it's Mrs. Bouquet. So I'm going to ask Madam Bouquet to introduce herself. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, yeah, Mrs. Bouquet, commercial cleaning. That's what we do. We cover contract cleaning across South Wales and Bristol. Um, and since COVID hit, has hit us, um, touch wood, we've been agile and we have launched a new um, sort of service in decontaminations. We now cover the UK um, cleaning and sanitizing buildings. Super. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and I stand corrected on that one, which is fine. So we're going to be looking at a whole um, raft of things this morning. Um, the session is recorded. Uh, so for those who are unable to attend or if you, any of your colleagues would like to um, participate but can't be here today, uh, we will be circulating a version of this for, for you to listen to. Um, it's also important that we have your questions. So please feel free to submit any questions you may have via the Q&A panel. Um, and I can see already there's quite a lot of activity on that. Thank you very much. Um, but please keep those questions coming as we go. Uh, we may try and um, bring other people into the conversation as we go. Um, clearly it's important to introduce two other panelists here. We've got uh, Harvey Wilde and Dave Butter of the HSE who are here to support Martin and give specific answers in their own fields. Um, so we may be directing questions to them. Um, there is a survey at the end. Please feel free to complete that survey. And uh, it's important to us because we need to know whether we're getting it right and how we can improve on that. Um, so without taking any more of your time, Martin, you're going to cover a whole raft of stuff. Do you want to tell us, tell us the story, please, from your perspective? Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everybody. I felt it would be appropriate to give you a brief introduction outlining the range of our activities relating to coronavirus. Um, and then no doubt you'll have lots of questions. And to that, uh, in uh, that regard, I've got David and Harvey to support me on the more specific aspects of what we are doing or what might be helpful to you uh, going forward. Now, I've got to say our first priority over this whole pandemic has been enabling wherever possible work to continue and protecting those at work. And throughout this period of time, we've issued revised and we hope proportionate operational policy positions to a wide range of industry and stakeholders and sectors. And this is being constantly reviewed and supplemented in the context of uh, uh, new science and new evidence that's coming forward and much dedicated coronavirus microsite um, which you can subscribe to for free and the really important thing is you do that because as each sector has different parameters and as things change if you subscribe to it for free you will actually get the automatic updates 
And that means you don't have to think, oh, what, what's happened? What's changed? What shall I do? It's come to you straight away. So I suggest you do that. Now, what sort of things have we been up to? Well, initially, um, a big area was, of course, on respiratory protective equipment or PPE in some ways. And we've been advising businesses, including the NHS and, of course, the Welsh uh, government on how to efficiently manage the provision and use of PPE and RPE, including the reuse of disposable items and on alternatives to certain items under significant supply pressure. And in particular, fit testing has been an important area. And again, information for those who still need it is available on the website. We've also been heavily involved in checking RPE PPE supplies from new sources, notably from abroad, to ensure that they can be used. And I've got to say, there have been a large volume of fake or inappropriate uh, items coming from overseas, which we've had to, in effect, filter out to make sure that people who think they're working safely are indeed working safely. And we've additionally been working with manufacturers offering to produce PPE. And the whole aspect of this has been to ensure that not only are supplies maintained, but as you know, dramatically increased. And that has happened. And fortunately, uh, whilst it, I don't think people have been able to completely keep up with demand, certainly the worrying yawning gap didn't occur. Overall guidance has been important, particularly in the early days of the pandemic. And again, we've worked with Can people hear me? We can now, Martin, go on. Yeah. Uh, and the devolved uh, parliaments on revised guidance for workers on things like general infection, prevention, prevention co and control, secondary care, handling clinical waste, and um, unfortunately, the prevention of infection from the deceased. What some may not know is that we're also a regulator for many of the laboratories in Britain, and we've been able to assist in changes to the ways of working for some of these labs to enable them to screen samples for COVID-19 under these exceptional circumstances. As, in, as a lot of you'll know, this has been a massive issue throughout the course of the pandemic, getting capacity up, which has been dramatically increased as these laboratories have come into play. Um, another aspect is on thing called biocidal products, which some of you may or may not know about, but um, we are an approving body for many of the chemicals that have been used across Europe um, and the labeling of those chemicals. And in this instance, we've been able to take action to unblock obstacles to enable the increased supply of biocidal hand sanitizer products into the market. And for example, again, you may well have heard about this, Drinks manufacturers have been able to redirect production of ethanol away from drink into hand sanitizers. And that was an urgent requirement at the beginning. And as of course, gradually eased as these products have come into the market. On regulatory activity, and there's a lot to cover on this, um, it's continued because of course, many sectors have not stopped working at all, or have at least some have reduced their level of operation. For example, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, financial services. Many of those people have continued working either fully or in part. And throughout the pandemic, we've had to respond to something around 7,800 workplace concerns and, uh, and are inspecting some of these in response. And this will, of course, uh, continue as more businesses return to work. And I'll come back to this. In, later in my comments. It's important to note that across all sectors, we continue to investigate work-related deaths, which sadly have continued, uh, serious major injuries and danger occurrences, and reported concerns from uh, the workforce or the public where people are being exposed to risk from work activities. And we have, and will still take action to secure compli compliance with the law. As I said earlier, though, our priority is to enable work to continue safely and healthily. There is, again, guidance on that, safer, safer workplace and guidance, uh, further guidance is supporting that as well. Um, 
And what I hope is going to be a helpful point, under the Health and Safety at Work Act, employers have a general duty to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare of their employees. Now, these requirements continue and have not in any way been diminished. However, in the context of dealing with coronavirus uh, or COVID-19, HSE considers that if an employer is following the relevant public health England or Wales or Scotland guidance for their sector in terms of the public health risks, they will be taking reasonable practical measure precautions to control workplace risks and that will be our stance when we talk to companies. The key is to follow the guidance that's out there in, on our website and I think your own chamber will have a lot of guidance as well too. Of course, returning to work is on many people's minds. It's at the forefront of businesses' minds. And in this respect, this is where further guidance comes in. The COVID-19 Secure Guidance for Business on this Necessary Safety Measures uh, was published on the 11th of May. It's constantly updated, supporting by an HSC guide on working safely during the outbreak break and there is a toolkit there to support employee engagement in this and their aim is to support the development of workplace risk assessment and management measures giving employees the confidence that they can return to work safely. All this covers things like uh, working close proximity settings, key messages to employees, social distancing, washing hands and the face, using stairs, reasonable workplace adjustments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as I said a moment ago, we've still been active in the workplace, but in line with requests from government, we have introduced a spot checking uh, of businesses for compliance with safer workplace guidance. Um, this will of course involve where appropriate, be it uh, telephone contact or HSE inspectors and local authority inspectors who have already been quite active visiting workplaces across a range of sectors to follow up any reports or concerns about safety in the workplace. Now, following the production of the guidelines, we've, we've uh, seen as expected an increase in contact from employers looking for advice and employees reporting concerns. We've significantly increased the capacity of our concerns and advice teams to cope with these additional inquiries. It's available to all, it's free. There is, as I said, lots of information on websites. Your chamber will have lots of information, but if you still don't know what to do, you can ring that helpline and hopefully we'll be able to help you find the right answer somewhere. And thousands of people have done that already. We've also been involved in developing the guidance, which many of you have seen along with days, the, the business department as part of the broader Safer Spaces framework covering schools, transport, recreation, work and travel. And uh, the, task, uh, the cabinet office set up uh, some task forces um, to ensure that the COVID-19 secure guidelines developed to match future ambition when things were being opened up. And it was built on existing guidance, including sector specific expert input. And the areas that were particularly looked at were non-essential retail, which you know in certain parts of the country are opening up, pubs and restaurants again, which again in certain parts of Britain are opening up, uh, recreation and leather, leisure and tourism, which has limited things, but is in parts opening up, places of worship again, which in parts of uh, the United Kingdom are working up an aviation which remains a very difficult area and we're involved in all of those groups and um, multiple subgroups as well. Perhaps on a point of detail on the 22nd of May we published further guidance on managing Legionella risk um, and that's particularly important I think for companies that are going back to work where there's air conditioning things like that so I just suggest to people if they are just opening up if they do have that sort of facility, then they should be looking at it. We're also working with Department of Transport on workforce uh, welfare facilities for lorry drivers, which has been a particular problem over the whole course of the pandemic. 
Can I just remind you that our various websites are full of detailed information, much of it specific for sectors, constantly kept up to date. The Chamber has all the details. And I'd also point you to, if you're perhaps a bigger company, um, a company called Aggregate Industries have actually produced a video, which is, I think, available online, which is a really good guidance on how a big organization manage a complex business or, uh, areas has actually put um, precautions in place. It's very informative, it's very helpful, and it's done by people who are in business and have to do it sensibly and profitably. So hopefully it will be helpful to those who think it might be relevant. And at that, I'll keep quiet and hand over, well, back to you, Paul, or, or is it to Rachel? Thanks, Martin. That's very kind of you. Um, clearly, you have been busy for the last three months um, and a lot of really useful information there. Um, I should have said at the start that there are lots of resources coming as a result of this. Uh, we will be circulating stuff from the HSC. We'll be stu cir circulating stuff from Mrs. Bouquet to make sure that uh, everybody is, is, is up to date. And of course, on our website and on the HSC website, and I'm sure on uh, the Mrs. Bouquet website, there's lots of good information as well. Rachel, you're going to talk to us a bit more about the practical side of, of the stuff that people can do. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we all know how important now cleaning and hygiene is for our work premises. Um, and it's definitely a conversation now. Cleaning is coming up in the boardroom that I can see and people are really taking it seriously. And the perception of the cleaning market um, has has changed, which I think is a real positive. So I've put together some sort of, you know, quick and easy tips really um, of, you know, areas to focus on in the workplace, whether you're currently in the workplace at the moment um, or whether you're thinking of coming back. Um, so the first thing was um, using the correct products. Um, so I've got a virucidal cleaner here and on the back, you can see all, all of the, all of the, um, you know, all of the um, information that half of it we think, do we, do we understand? But the most, the most important um, disinfectant to use with coronavirus is a Public Health England approved in, in what I uh, recommend, which is an EN14476. Um, so just to make sure that your disinfectants, that your cleaners are using, um, you know, you've, you've got the correct products and also that they are using them um, with the right process and, and using the right materials. So um, uh, colour-coded cloths to pre prevent cross-contamination. Um, now and before and more importantly going forward will be key making sure that they washed on a high wash um, and then we're not, you know, um, kind of, you know, moving the germs and things um, and the pathogens around. But if you can to use reusable cloths and mops, I would suggest that. Um, it can be as simple as just, you know, blue cloth um, and then throw it away after use. Um, usual hand sanitizing stations around, you've probably seen this a lot. Um, entry points, even thinking outside of your building, there'll be hot spots in the building, and that usually tends to be um, obviously people's desks, keyboards, toilet areas, and entry points and kitchen points. So trying to look at that um, to you know put in hand sanitizing stations there. Um, moving on to the washrooms, so even thinking of germs. Um, you know, and bacteria as well um, in this, it's, it's important that, you know, you've even got the right um, uh, toilet rolls and hand soaps in, in the uh, toilets as well. And I would definitely remove all loose toilet roll and make sure that they're all in units at least. And if you can um, have them so they're touchless, so they're automatic um, and, you know, if, if you um, want any recommendations on suppliers, I'm happy to share that as well. Um, trying to think of 
the entry points of buildings have you got sufficient doormats those types of things again trying to prevent as much stuff coming in um, and your bin disposal so re-looking at your bin disposal is there you know a lot of kind of you know touch points of people touching the bin um, you know if you are making coffees I would suggest not to have that because all those are real hot spots um, of touch points in, in a building um, and then how you're actually removing that waste from, from the premises, especially if you have had any, any real life cases. Um, enhancing your cleaning regime is recommended. I personally think it is time now to show more of your cleaners in the daytime. It really gives a positive message um, and it shows your staff that you're safeguarding them as much as possible. Um, and I think that visual does really make a difference there, especially, you know, for the, for the culture piece. Um, and, and on the culture piece, really, really making sure that all of your staff are, you know, they're all aware that they need to be cleaning their stations down before and after them as well. And, and getting that, um, you know, the camaraderie there for working together this is really important. You know, you could have um, wipes on people's desks as well. Um, it, it depends how far you want to go, but encouraging them and having stations where it's really easy and natural um, for them to wipe things down, not always be relied upon on the cleaners. Clean, uh, clear signage as well. Um, you know, you probably know all this now, but the, the signage makes such a difference. Um, and, and lastly, if you have had any live cases or you want to, you know, go any further, making sure that you're decontaminating the building as well, sanitizing it, there's companies out there that can provide fogging services to completely, you know, as I, I explain it um, to, you know, people who don't do this day in, day out, it's basically where, um, you know, blasting that chemical throughout your whole building to make sure it goes onto every single surface. Um, and, you know, they were some of the tips that I put together. Um, I don't want to say too much on the health and safety side, but obviously we do a risk assessment first and, and work from there. Super. Thank you, Rachel. That's um, an excellent summary of some of the practical things that people would do. Just sitting here listening about it, it just, it just demonstrates how complex this is and how far wide ranging the challenge is for businesses. Let me just lift it up a couple of layers if I can. And can we just start with something that's, that's uh, you know, high on the list of questions that we're asked on a day to day basis, which is how how do I get my people back to work? How, how do I give them the confidence that work is safe and you know, that we have taken all the necessary precautions to, 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 to do what we can to protect them and their families? Martin, did you want to pick that up? Um, yes, and, but I, I will also hand over to um, Harvey and David. But um, the, the really big thing is that um, you've, also, you've got to, first of all, decide those who don't need to come to work and those who can properly and appropriately and safely work from home. Um, we actually have a thing we use internally, which I might give the, send to the chamber, which just asks people to have in mind when people are working from home, they're actually having to work from home in, a, in a, often an unnatural environment for them. And you have to take that into account when you're looking at how they work, what they do and how they do it and what you can expect of them in those circumstances. It's not a rule book, it's just things to bear in mind. So I might send those through to the chamber because I think other people have found them useful. But thereafter, this risk assessment is a really important part of it because that, and it's got to be worked with the workforce to, to, to all the extent that it's possible to do so, so that they felt, and very often as we know, that they're the people in, at the, the coal face they're the people who can actually bring very practical issues to the table that help you to make sure that the risk assessment 
is practical and doable and works with the grain of how people work rather than imposing things that are just unnatural to the normal working practices. And if you've involved them, they're more likely to believe it's credible and go along with it. And it should be displayed very clearly in the workplace to show what's expected of people. And uh, Rachel has already said, lots of signage around so that it reminds people and gives them proper guidance. But there are other things which aren't what you might call absolutely necessary, but you've got to think about people's practical things about how they get to work. Uh, they might car share, and that might not be a sensible possibility nowadays. So you've got to see whether doing staggered work times, all those things, which actually are normally a pain for a business, but actually if you really want to get people back to work sooner rather than later, you might have to think beyond the office or the factory wall and actually see what will facilitate people working. Uh, so those are the sort of background, but that risk assessment is a really important part. Um, David and Harvey, anything to add to that? Um, I'll, I'll just pick up on, on, on the risk assessment and the controls. And the key throughout all of this is, is communication. Now, um, Martin's given an example of, of one company putting a, a video on YouTube. It's there, it's accessible to all the employees, it's accessible to customers to say, this is the way that we work now. These are the standards that we are, and they actually take people through from the, um, the gate of the quarry and working the way through. If you were collecting a product or you were dealing with a Weybridge, it, it's a very, very easy way of communicating that. Some companies have published huge glossy brochures. And again, these are sort of the multinational companies, and you can go on to the, you know, lots of these companies, and you'll find a brochure saying, this is us. This, these are our COVID-19 standards. This is what we expect in the plant. These are, these are the standards we expect for our customers, for our supply chain, for the deliveries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, others have, have gone far more simply and actually re, um, reintroduced staff to work as well. And I think that's key. If people have been away for a long time, not just on the controls for, for COVID-19, but also may well need a refresher on how this particular mean, machine works, how this process is, what, what is it we used to do? So again, I think is offering that to employees as well who may feel a little bit anxious about, I've literally forgotten what I used to do or how I used to do it. So giving them an opportunity to perhaps come back in early to go through the process, see the workplace before they actually start um, mm -hmm. up and running. Um, and the other aspects I think is also getting the, the conversation early and, and Martin again um, alluded to, we have a talking toolkit. It, it's based on the talking toolkit we did for workplace stress and it's a way for employers to start conversations with employees and it goes through a series of questions and through that again it, it's building up an understanding and trust and also allowing you to explain well yep we, we've thought of that and this is what we're doing now yep we've thought of that this is what we're doing now so it acts as a um, as a conversation starter but also leads you through all those things that would come to the end and say yes you know what we thought of all of those we've we've implemented our controls as far as reasonably practical we're now good to go um and i think the communication really in and the same with customers and also don't forget your supply chain because obviously you'll have deliveries coming in potentially you'll have deliveries going out uh, you may have interactions with members of the public and you may have to think about those interactions uh differently but don't forget about them and again whether it be YouTube, whether it be a poster, whether it be a certificate that you post, make sure you've got a line of communication there where, you, and I think people are, are more likely to follow the things um, if they understand them and know them beforehand, rather than sort of turning up on site and all of a sudden there's a whole list of rules. Well, where do I go? What do I do? How do I deal with that now? Where do I clock in? Where do I get changed now? What? Mm -hmm. So it's better to, to prepare people for work. And if you've got the opportunity to do so, and I say small, groups to have a look around beforehand or FaceTime. Um, if people have got, um, you know, simple things with, with a mobile phone, just walk people through the workplace before they come back. So it's just thinking about, you'll all know your workforce better than I will. You'll know what works for them and what they are um, more likely to engage with. So um, just think, think about what works for you, what works for your staff and how best you can communicate what you need people to do through your supply chain, through your customers, and, and dealing with all those contacts. 
Um, I, I think I'd just pick up on the, the point that David was making earlier on about the phased return to work. You know, don't expect everybody to turn up all on day one and be all completely on board with everything that you're doing. So bringing people back uh, in groups, making them aware in advance, you know, working with them, um, you know, so to speak, you know, breaking them back into um, the, the workplace, how the canteen's going to work uh, and all those kind of things things is is really important for, in order for you to give yourself the best chance of embedding everything and it working and then supporting people with it and you know putting adequate supervision and monitoring in um, you know to make sure that people are, are following things you're reinforcing stuff and this is what you want people to do because you're also going to have to change how people have been working you know if they are working further apart or staggered or you know they're they're working working in smaller groups or whatever it may be, they're going to have to get used to that and you're going to have to build in the time um, for, for that to happen, uh, but also for people to get used to the new ways of working. So, you know, you've got to give everybody that sort of like sporting chance of it working because if everybody turns up nine o'clock Monday morning, mm -hmm. it's going to fall over really quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rachel, any comments on that? Um, I think, yeah, I think obviously that was really clear. Um, I, I think for me, just thinking of the cleaning side, having that presence around in the daytime of more cleaners and touch points, it really does um, give a good message as well as an employer. So, um, you know, something, something to think about. Um, it's all great, you know, getting them back in, kind of treating it as, as inducting them back into the business, isn't it, in clusters, but then ongoing, how are we, how are we, how can we mentally, um, you know, remain that they're going to be safe um, and from a cleaning and hygiene, just even changing, you know, the consumables and clear signage and um, more presence will also give that message as well. Good, thank you. Um, one of the questions that we get a lot of um, is the issues around common areas. Um, so workstations, people can understand, and, and Rachel's already made the point about making sure that you clean before and you clean after, and that's, that seems to be a process that's being adopted. Um, but there, there are questions for, for employers, um, for landlords also, who have, who have multiple businesses potentially in one building around uh, shared facilities. Now, clearly the provision of toilets isn't essential and Rachel, you've covered off some great ideas around the respect of dis dispensing of, 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 of toilet paper and, and hand soap and such like. But what about kitchens um, or, or coffee stations or water coolers or areas like that? What's, what's the collective view on that? From a, from, let's start with an, from an HSE perspective first. Which one do you, do you want to pick that up, Harvey? Is that you? I'll, 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 yeah. I'll just start. I mean, the, the key is if you can reduce the amount of common touch areas, it's most uh, sort of most practical thing to do so you don't have those areas there. If there are things that you must provide and it can't be provided in any other way, then again, it's making sure that you have a, um, a cleaning uh, and sanitization uh, regime that is very, very regular. Uh, and again, um, that's something to um, look at. You've got the correct products, et cetera. I have seen some, I've seen some innovation, um, some things I didn't think I would ever see. One, um, I was sent an example um, just this week was of uh, a pull handle. And as you pulled it, it actually dispensed hand sanitizer. Now, <laughs> I didn't expect to be, um, you know, looking into a world where that was necessary or, or was there. So, um, whilst you know that wasn't a thing three week um three months ago it's a thing mm -hmm. now it's a product that's on the market i haven't look, i'm not endorsing it i haven't seen it i've just been made aware of it so it, again it's also thinking about how can we do those things differently so for example if you've got a cold water dispenser well have the cold water dispenser but everybody has their own cup and they keep their own cup and they're responsible for their own cup and they don't share their own cup rather than providing again another area where somebody's got to go collect something put it back and somebody then may mm. pick that up so just think about what the interaction is and how can we minimize that person 
to surface and then surface to another person contact. Um, and I say, you know, you'd be surprised. Google is a wonderful um, research tool. You'll find all sorts of things, but I say, do your, uh, make sure you do your research thoroughly and the things do actually work and will work for you. Um, but I would just try and reduce them as much as you can. Obviously, if you've got a machine um, that somebody has to key in certain things, well, you know, the business can't operate with somebody operating that keyboard. And that keyboard may be used by three or four operators. But then it's just part of your induction and you're going back to work as in the saying, right, this is our routine now. You arrive, you clean your hands, you clean the keyboard, we do your inputting, you then clean your hands and clean the keyboard, and then you go away, and the next person comes in and does that. So again, getting in, in into that ritual. Um, there are also questions, and, and this was a debate that was held recently about um, doors. So <clears throat> doors in corridors, doors between offices, doors between common areas, which may have push pads on them. Um, or handles to, to draw it. And, and picking on your point, David, not everyone has got a, a squeegee behind it that dispenses uh, hand sanitizer. But um, some of these are fire doors. So is there, is, is there an acceptance that some of these doors may be propped open um, during the ordinary working day to, to reduce contact points? Yeah. Or, uh, or does the fire officer get upset with this? Um, it's a, if it's a fire door, I'm afraid it's going to have to remain um, in, in the closed position. It's, it's there. It's part of the obviously uh, fire spread prevention. But again, what we've advocated with all other doors, there, there are two benefits. One is that you're, you're reducing the common contact area, but also you may well be increasing ventilation through the buildings as well. So again, that's, you know, we, we, we've, we've often talked about safe air, safe surfaces, safe people. So part of your safe air, I mean, obviously, if you're working outside, that's brilliant. So opening doors has a number of benefits. But again, we would, if they're not a fire door um, and you're able to, then prop those open. I mean, if you've got a noisy environment um, and it's part of your noise enclosure, again, think about some of the wider aspects of doing that. But certainly, I'm afraid fire doors will have to remain uh, in the closed position. Sure. And I guess you've got the security aspect coming from that as well. Um, there are a number of questions coming in uh, this morning around um, HSE checks, future HSE checks, and potential changes to regulation going forward. Um, Martin, what's your view on that from, from an HSE perspective? I think, first of all, Harvey, do you want to pick that up and then I'll come in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, as you're no doubt aware, um, HSE are carrying out a number of um, spot checks. These spot checks are taking a number of forms. They're both uh, proactive and reactive. Um, so we're following up uh, concerns that people have raised with us about COVID matters. Uh, we're also getting in contact with people proactively. Um, some of that contact is being done remotely by phone. Uh, other, um, you know, if we're not getting satisfactory responses, then that will be followed up um, with actual site visits. So we're doing a whole range of things to ensure that we're undertaking spot checks. Um, I did notice in one of the questions um, that has been asked further on is, you know, well, how do we deal with remote areas of the country? Uh, well, there are a number of areas of the, of the country that are remote. Uh, obviously, if we can do things um, via uh, telephone checks, but if we've got uh, significant concerns. Uh, if things aren't adding up, then we will go and visit as we always have done. Um, so in that sense of things, uh, you know, we, we haven't changed how we're approaching stuff. Um, what I would say is, though, in relation to the spot checks that we've been undertaking so far, what we found by, by and large is that um, most employers are compliant or can achieve compliance just with verbal advice. Um, and within HSC, See, you know, we've got a number of levels of enforcement that we can take, um, giving people verbal advice, writing to people where we find material breaches, or if there are more significant things that are wrong and need to be put right, uh, we can issue enforcement notices or go all the way through to for very serious breaches for uh, to prosecution and that side of things. But what we're finding in the vast majority of cases in relation to looking at COVID control measures is that people are following the 
guidance that have been uh, produced by the various public health bodies. And if you're doing that, then you will be doing what's reasonably practical and being, com being compliance. And we're finding with most companies, um, just some verbal advice will um, improve things to the extent that we don't need to do anymore. We do follow that up to ensure that any verbal advice that we have given has been actually um, taken on board and dealt with. So we don't just leave it at, oh, we've given you some verbal advice, isn't that great? We will follow up and make sure that that's actually been um, adhered to. Um, but what we are finding when we're doing spot checks and visits is where we're finding um, non-compliance with the law is over the conventional health and safety matters, the non-COVID issues. So that's where we're finding work at height issues, unguarded machinery, and the standard things that, that we would look at at any type of inspection. That's where we're finding the non-compliances. Companies are actually doing a lot of work with COVID and uh, putting in place what they need to put in place. Probably a point to pick up on is that um, our normal way of working, particularly on inspections, is we, we really do uh, work in a very targeted way. We analyse uh, the field, as it were. We look at those areas that we perceive to have the highest risk, or we have been tipped off, or we perceive it's something ourselves that's going on. Um, and so our whole regime of inspections is typically information driven um, and risk driven. What we are being asked to do by the government is to do much more spot checking than we would have ever done before, uh, even on places that you might consider to be of low risk in terms of a health and safety perspective. But of course, the COVID issues remain probably the same as many other working places. So we are encouraging to, that to happen, but um, being encouraged for that to happen. But the really key thing I come back to is uh, right at the beginning, I said our whole thrust has been to enable people to work, to actually allow companies to get back in business and to allow the workforce to work there safely and feel safe. And that's our whole thrust here. And that's why what Harvey said, much of what we do when we find, particularly in the public health part side of it, is if we find something wrong or somebody's rung us up and said they're concerned about the workplace and we go to the company on the telephone and ask them what they're doing, what we find is that actually most people are trying to do the right thing. And actually they take notice of it and hopefully what we've done is help them to work and get back into a profitable business level of operation rather than actually stop them. And that has been the predominant outcome. Good, because I think that there is a sense of fear of, of litigation um, in that, you know, they can't take every single box. And I think the words that you've used about guidance, about help, and about uh, how you use the word being reasonable um, is, it, it is some comfort to people, at least if they're, if, if they're intending to do the right thing. Rachel, can I just pick up on a couple of practical things? We talked about communal areas, um, and, yeah. and clearly one of those is, is workplace kitchens. Um, and, and whether that's a common kitchen for a number of companies or one kitchen for, for a staff. And I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear that um, a lot of companies are not using their kitchens. They're using it as a, as a space where staff can, can eat socially distanced, et cetera, but bring their own food and bring their own drinks to try and reduce the risk. Um, but then when, when we get into the other facilities, such as toilets, uh, one question that's been sent to us this morning is, you know, what's, what's the debate between hand dryers versus paper towels? How, how, how does that work? What are, the, what are the practical things? And then moving that on also then to look at if, if picking up David's point that a fire door is actually a door that people have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, how do, we, how do we prevent that becoming a, a, a source of, of, of virus? Um, right, okay, so um, to answer the first one, which was to do with the toilet, the hand dryers, um, all of our clients now are not using hand dryers. Um, so I, I would suggest not to use them. Um, obviously, you want people to be encouraging them to wash their hands. The last thing you want them to do is, you know, maybe not wash them as thoroughly, use a hand dryer, and then it 
you know sprays sprays everywhere if you really see what a hand dryer does it doesn't actually always dry properly so um at least with hand towels you can dispose of them then in the right way and if you're increasing your cleaning regime those bins should be emptied a couple times a day then um, depending on the, the size of the premises that you've got um, and then the other point then is um, this is where things like fogging and sanitizing comes in to it and um, so for large organizations um, what we are doing there is we are fogging premises even with a ride on sanitizer now as well to blast areas of huge manufacturing plants because you can't can't always sanitize certain workstations in a cleaning um, when you're cleaning you know for example um, a line in a manufacturing plant um, you've you've got to you've got to do that really with a fogging method um, so that that's how I would approach that. And with the kitchens, it's increasing your um, your you know your your um, your cleaning regime. So you're constantly um, cleaning down and sanitizing those hot spots. But also, what I have seen with some of our clients as well is they have made smaller um, type of stations for coffees as well. So they're putting them into pods of people who work together, trying not to get everybody to use the kitchen, but then they may have several, um, you know, um, water stations and um, kettles and things around. And again, the disposable cups, um, we're constantly encouraging that. And usually people using their own mug as well is, is working well, because there's an element here of you still want to have that, that team spirit. And that's where some of those, you know that those where your bonding comes from from work so i think that's important but if you're if you're sanitizing and you're fogging the premises you know it could be every 30 days every week depending on what chemicals the cleaning company is using but there is chemicals um that you can use every 30 days and it has a kill time on it and I guess for either side of doors and as such like, that's about putting hand sanitizer stations either side of that door and making sure that, they're, that the staff are guided to use it. Yeah, yeah. And um, like the wipes and things as well. A couple more issues that, uh, certainly there's a, there's a debate going on down here now about um, the use of public transport and how do I get my people to work? And, and, and certainly we, we've mentioned this already. Um, Car sharing was something I think Martin or David, I can't remember either one of you said, uh, is, 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 is an issue and it's a risk. Um, is it to be encouraged? Is it to be discouraged? Uh, is it okay with two people in the car, one in the front, one in the back? What's, what, what's the sense? What's, what's the best advice? Uh, David, is that you? Yeah, I'll, um, it, it, <laughs> Like all things, it depends. Obviously, if you've got a co, if you uh, have arranged your workplace so you so you're in cohorts or in small bubbles, whatever you wish to call them, or in shifts, and those people that travel together actually work together, um, there may be um, something. You, and if they actually live together, you may have, you know, it's it's not uncommon for um, households to work at the same premises. So if those people are already within the the sort of the, the household bubble, family bubble, they live together. Um, then they may uh, there may not be an issue on them traveling together. The issue that you would have would be if you had, for example, um, uh, say a seven seater um, um, sort of, um, I could have call it a bus, I'm not, it's a sort of people carrier. Yeah. And then you populated that with six other households who were then going to work in six other parts of the workplace. You can see how you have increased the risk of transmission. Um, and in that so that I would suggest no that's not a particularly good idea we all, we all understand that people have to get to work uh, and, and obviously um, government advice has been to try and reduce um, obviously public transport is a reduced capacity to enable social distancing to go ahead and that's where the staggered start times help as well so you don't have to get everybody there for nine o'clock or eight thirty or whatever the start time happens to be that people can come in waves and can leave in waves which will help with um, public transport if people can work and walk or cycle that's probably the least, least risk because you're out in the 
um, open air and obviously this time of year as long as it's not raining uh, or not too hot because we all complain about one or the other won't we um, that's probably the best way um, to get to work but single people in cars car sharing really shouldn't be encouraged um, but obviously if it's if it's people who live together within the same household who then work together then obviously that that would continue but it's something that that we have to be cognizant of that that you've got a community risk that comes together in the workplace and can go away from the workplace and go in, in the community so again it's thinking about how do we reduce the risk of transmission the other thing i, I would also um suggest businesses to be aware of is if you like in their forward planning what would happen if that driver or that passenger then did become COVID-19 positive, all those people in that vehicle then would be a close contact when it come back to contact, track and trace. And what impact would that have on the business? So think as well as business continuity in those transport environments. And that's why it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the risk assessment process sometimes may have to go beyond your processes, your plant, your environment think about how do people get here and does and could that potentially have an impact um, on the business for a start and saying and certainly now with with, with contact track and trace coming uh, coming in are we are there close contacts that we could do something about or suggest people to do something about um, but I say each business will be different they'll know how people get to work but putting lots of people into a very small space with the windows shut from different households, then, you know, go to different parts of business is not a good idea. So there's just, there's, there's one aspect that's important um, that we need to bring up here. If, if as a business you're operating in, in your normal way and you've taken all the necessary precautions to, to keep the place clean, non-essential staff are working from home, you may have phased the number of people that are in work at any one time, start times, etc. So broadly, the advice that we've all been talking about here this morning has been adhered to. Um, but you were unfortunate enough to have a member of staff who develops COVID-19 symptoms and later becomes confirmed to have COVID-19. What happens then? Um, it, it, it depends on the numbers, if it's one person. Um, hopefully they will tell their employer uh, for a start. And I think that's key um, that, you know, we don't have people thinking, well, oh, I'm going to miss out. And that's where the preparatory work comes in place that people feel that they will be supported and looked after if they can't attend to work. And also think about agency workers in this. Don't give people the incentive to come to work ill and not tell you um, that they're ill. Cause again, that will then um, cause issues. If you've taken all that advice, and you've followed it so you've um you don't have any close contacts within the workplace then that person will follow the the um the relevant advice which would be i think it's still 14 days um that they would um, remain at home and then they return after that date if there's been no contact close contact within the workplace then the workplace will remain open will remain running because uh, bear, bearing in mind that this is everywhere it's work is one aspect of um, potential transmission but then there's what people do socially uh, in the evenings weekends etc so if if there is nothing within the workplace that has been um, um, sort of in increased the risk of transmission beyond the two meters um, social distancing obviously if people can be a meter apart but if they've got a solid screen between the two of them that would be that wouldn't be um, class as a close contact so if the business has done all that it can is implemented all those controls then that one person would remain off work and if there were no close contacts with that person within the workplace um well i mean the thing they can't control is socially but then again contact track and trace would, would would deal with that and that's why we've always sort of suggested that think about it and you know and, and there are other mitigations that you can do, such as, you know, there's been talk of social bubbles, bubbles, cohorts, keeping shifts together. Again, if that does happen, minimise the risk to your business, which is also, say, it's two-pronged. It's minimising transmission to a smaller group, but it's also securing your, your, your business as well. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's well worth doing to think about it, and certainly as people coming back, thinking, and I do think it's worth having that contingency planning uh, as part of risk assessment, if the worst happens, how do we minimise the effect on the business? Excellent. Thank you. 
Rachel, lots of discussion about um, making the place safe and the use of cleaners and the increased routine of cleaners and increased visibility. Um, tell us about how we keep cleaners safe in this process. Um, yeah, so obviously it starts the, with the same process really of, you know, doing a risk assessment, you know, on, on that. Um, for us, we're keeping cleaners um, to only certain sites. Um, to obviously prevent the risk there as well. Um, the, the usual sanitizing, hand sanitizers, washing your hands constantly. Um, we've put, um, you know, signs up where, where we are cleaning things like toilets as well. And um, they've got the right uh, PPE on. Um, so things like that probably weren't be um in you know plants and things people aren't used to that where they've got to wait until they can go into a toilet we've got to really think um around how do we protect our staff because we've got hundreds of them out there um and they're in very different types of premises as well so there's all you, you know separate um risk assessments going on which is uh, <laughs> very um very difficult um, but touch wood, those, those methods have worked well um, and I think the PPE has been the, the, the real big thing for us and on the, on the point of pub, um, public transport for us, we deal with a lot of cleaners who use public transport. We've been fortunate to actually work with local public transport. Um, and it's been so refreshing to see actually what they're really doing behind the scenes to make sure those buses are cleaned um, and, you know, COVID free as possible. Um, and what I'm seeing a difference in organisations is when, um, when, they, when they're then sanitising and, they, and they're fogging because that's kind of the next step then. Um, but all that then has an impact on our cleaners. And it, and it safeguards them. Okay. Um, moving on from that, um, we obviously have a two metre distance still here um, in, in Wales. Um, and you know, from, from what we know, that's going to be maintained. Um, questions around the use of gloves and the use of masks. Um, you know, should masks be compulsory? Should people be asked to wear them if at any stage that two meter distance is is reduced because of the work environment or passing on a corridor or whatever what what's what's the hse's view in respect of the use of masks i think that's you harvey isn't it yeah um i mean our, our view is outside of um of a healthcare setting so where you're dealing with a, a patient who has or is suspected to have um, COVID-19, then we wouldn't uh, normally expect people to be wearing PPE, personal protective equipment for COVID, so respirators and the such like. Um, if you can't maintain the two metre distance, then what we'd expect you to do is to look at the hierarchy of controlling that. So, you know, maintaining two metres where you can, where you can't, can you put screens in place, are there other ways of working, can you, you stagger people so they're not facing each other, there are a whole series of things that you can do as control measures um, before you get down to uh, a residual level of risk uh, and then it would have to be significant for you to require personal protective equipment. Sorry, is my, uh, can everybody still hear me? My uh, thing is beeping away. Yeah, uh, yeah that's fine. Um, so in, in terms of all of that, we're not expecting people um, outside of the healthcare setting to be wearing respirators or masks or for that to be necessary, except where they need to wear respirators or gloves or personal protective equipment for other reasons so if you're handling uh, hazardous chemicals as uh, some of the cleaners may be then they'll have to wear gloves for that you still continue to wear gloves for those things if you're in a dusty environment then again you'll be wearing a respirator to be in that dusty environment and you'd continue doing that but you wouldn't be wearing those things because of uh, because of covid um, so that's that's where we are at the moment with personal protective equipment 
obviously we're keeping that all under review uh, as we be, as we learn more about the uh, the illness and how it's transmitted and all that side of things so it's constantly being reviewed but that is the current guidance that's being uh, provided by all the public health bodies um, and one thing I would say is is that the guidance in terms of that is consistent for workplaces uh, and we've been working with the various um, devolved nations in order to uh, ensure that um, guidance there is read across and you know we haven't got inconsistent standards there but I'll hand over to David at this point who might be able to furnish some more examples of what people have been doing where they go below two meters in order to put in reasonable um, engineering controls and other controls yeah and 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 that's where on, on the social distancing on the two meters we, we 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 will still require that um and again that's where the risk assessment process comes in if, if you're not going to keep two meters apart then what you're going to implement that's going to be equally as good as being two meters apart so you know classically in in the food industry um we see a huge use of perspex screens the same as you'll see in the supermarket at the cash register because there are certain things that you can't do you can't pay or get your shopping um, over the um, scanner um, two meters apart that unless you throw it I guess at somebody and they catch it and and, 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 and through it goes so things like that physical barriers um, are very useful but again you then have to introduce your cleaning regime because again they can be a surface upon which um, um, potentially the virus could um, could sit um, we've seen um, just literally rearranging people so some people have extended um, the, um, the production line, put an extra belt in, moved quality assurance, you know, just move people around. Um, but also think about going back to your supply chain. Um, we have seen people have gone back to, to batch production. So rather than producing all the products at once with lots of people, they'll produce one product on the morning shift, a different product on the um, afternoon shift, uh, which requires different parts of the factory, but allows you know social distancing to be um to be maintained and again a great example with one of the food producers was they went back to their customer um i forget what the product they were producing but it required three different types of salad leaf um which required three people to deliver that because of obviously the food safety um, aspects and so they went back to the customer and said look can we just change the recipe slightly and put one salad leaf on it didn't really alter the customer experience. You're not going to know when you're munching into your wrap or your sandwich, well, it's got three or four or whatever different types of, of sandwich. It wasn't a huge loss. The, their customer said, yes, that's fine. They, they could take two people off the line. They could maintain the social distancing. So throughout all of this, we will always go back to the risk assessment and say, why can't you maintain two meters? And that needs to be very robust. Um, what they come back to us with to say why they can't. And then if they can't, okay, you can't. But then what have you done that's of an equal standard to that. And again, that's kind of where our conversations will, will be on those sites. This is where the chamber can be really, really helpful in that the number of companies we've come up to have said, oh, we can't do it, it's impossible, we can't change. And then they have come up with the most innovative ways of getting around this. And I would just say to everybody, steal with pride, go around and find what others are doing in the chamber you're a brilliant organization for sharing information and you will find that people have found all sorts of ways of getting over what appeared to be impossible at first sight. Well that sounds like a brilliant note for us to get out on. Um, thank you Martin for that, uh, for that exit piece. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, my sincere thanks to, to Rachel Flanagan, to Martin Temple, to David and to Harvey for your time this morning. We've run slightly over time. I apologise for that because I know your diaries are, are, are jammed full. Um, there are some questions that we haven't been able to get to this morning. Um, what I will do is as long as you've given us your name um, in, in, when you've submitted the question, we will come back to you specifically because I know there are some important ones here um, around the hospitality industry but also around nurseries and childcare. So we do need to get back to a selection of questions there. And I'm sure that Rachel and the HSE team will be happy to provide those responses. There are a lot of resources coming as a result of this session this morning. So we'll be drawing on both Rachel and on the HSE to post both on our website and in subsequent communications about this 
out to the, the, the wider people about uh, the resources that are being provided. And as I said, the session has been recorded, so you can review it, you can go back to it, you can call on it, and you can uh, forward it off to, to your friends. So um, survey at the end is a final reminder, please complete that on our behalf. We're very grateful. Thank you to everybody who has participated. Thank you to, to David, to Harvey, to Rachel and to Martin. And we look forward to seeing you again very shortly on our next session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.